Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining this panel, uh, Center for Geopolitics. Uh, we still have, I think, more participants coming in, but since it's time, I'm going to uh, start the introduction of this panel. Uh, again, thank you for joining. Um, so today um, uh, is the panel on Tim ASEAN and Timor Leste. And actually, this is the one of the two uh, panel uh, uh, so in this week. So um, <clears throat> let me just share the screen. OK. Um, so um, today uh, we have uh, three uh, distinctive speakers and uh, speaking on kind of international and geopolitics uh, dimension aspects uh, in the ASEAN and Timor relations. <clears throat> so um, the first speaker is Dr. Rebecca. Uh, she will discuss Timor effort to gain membership in the ASEAN, uh, exploring how why Timor Leste has pursued ASEAN membership in the context of its broader foreign policies, priorities, and interests since the achieving independence in 2002. And second speaker, uh, Professor Lee, uh, we discuss uh, from the, the, the opposite view, I mean, from the ASEAN's view, uh, asking why uh, Timor Leste has been kept waiting to join ASEAN for 11 years since the independence uh, and before uh, admitted in the principle in 2022. So he will identify the uh, proponent op opponent of Timor Leste's membership, identifying an ongoing doubt about Timor Leste's capacity and stabilities, concern from uh, fellow member members about uh, the uh, divergence and the growing geopolitics uh, concern that finally won out. And finally, um, Dr. Arontina Mika. Uh, we will mainly discuss the geopolitics implication of Timor Leste participation in ASEAN uh, to Timor Leste and ASEAN relations. She is an expert working on Timor Leste China relations. So she's going to bring offer the, the kind of perspective how the Timor Leste joining, uh, Timor Leste participation in ASEAN have uh, kind of implications uh, toward the relation between China and Timor Leste and also ASEAN and the Timor Leste as well. Right, uh, okay, since uh, we have time, okay. Uh, let's uh, move on to the uh, the panel talk. So um, most of all, uh, please, um, Dr. Rebecca, it's your time to uh, start. I just stopped my screenshot. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Taka, and the Centre for Geopolitics for the invitation uh, to speak today. So what I'm going to talk about is Timor Leste's efforts to gain membership into ASEAN, focusing on how and why uh, Timor Leste has pursued membership in the context of its broader foreign policy priorities and interests since achieving independence in 2002. So I want to start with some background on Timor Leste's foreign policy as a way of getting into this question of how uh, of what its motivations are regarding ASEAN membership. So I just want to, to clarify that this presentation is based on research that I undertook uh, in Timor Leste for a book I wrote a few years ago now on how post colonial states reproduce sovereignty through foreign policy discourses, norms, and behavior. So uh, you might consider my contribution contribution to the panel today as uh, more of contemporary history. Uh, and in the book, I argued that since independence, Timor-Leste's vision of sovereignty is shaped by its historical struggle for recognition and by the means through which it became recognised as an independent sovereign state in the international community. So for Timor-Leste, this aspiration is shaped by its history of external interventions, uh, whether it's from Portuguese colonialism uh, through to Indonesia's occupation of the territory from 1975 until 1999, uh, through to the extensive UN missions uh, that it was exposed to uh, after the independence ballot in 1999 until May 20, uh, 2002, uh, when uh, it attained uh, its formal, formally recognised independence. 
So in the book, I utilise a small state foreign policy framework, which is a kind of obvious choice, given that Timor-Leste is generally classified in the, in the literature as a small state, uh, which is typically characterised by geography, uh, by population size. So states under 10 million are often, uh, 10 million people are often ca categorised as small states, uh, as well as uh, through the degree of influence that, uh, that states might hold in international relations. Uh, it's a it can be a bit of a problematic framework given that there are over 100 member states of uh, the United Nations that are classified as small states. So that's, you know, could, could be seen as most of the world states. Uh, but nevertheless, the small state foreign policy literature suggests that small states are often driven to cooperate with others to ensure their survival within the international system uh, and to try to negotiate the vulnerabilities that arise due to their size, particularly in relation to uh, bigger states. Uh, and they do this uh, through, uh, through uh, activities such as engaging in multilateralism uh, and in promoting international law. So since independence, Timor-Leste, uh, as, as the book tracks, uh, developed an ambitious foreign policy uh, that incorporates quite a large range of relations uh, within various global, regional and cultural multilateral forums. So Timor-Leste's approach to foreign policy has been largely to avoid having to rely upon one state or rely upon one region, uh, but to hedge against dependence as a way of ensuring its sovereignty, uh, which is really uh, sort of in the Timor in, in the Timor-Leste's discourses is really seen through the lens of, of independence or having that kind of exclusive uh, or absolute control uh, within a particular uh, territory so that 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 sort of executive authority uh, within uh, the boundaries of the state uh, and that is no real surprise given uh, the struggles uh, that uh, that the Timorese nation uh, went through in order to achieve its independence to be recognized by the international community as, as a sovereign state in its own right so rather Rather than just focus on the immediate neighbourhood, Timor-Leste's international relations extends actually across multiple regions, East and Southeast Asia, the South Pacific, Europe, particularly uh, in its close relationship with its former coloniser Portugal, and even into Africa, uh, particularly, and, and um, Latin America in, in the relations uh, that Timor-Leste has pursued uh, with fellow Portuguese language uh, speaking states. Nevertheless, uh, ASEAN membership has been the cornerstone of, of Timor's uh, foreign policy in many ways. Now, Timor-Leste, if we think about where it is situated uh, in the world, is in something of a liminal space or a kind of transitional zone, uh, situated at the intersection of the regions of Southeast Asia on the one hand, but also the South Pacific on the other. And so resistance leaders preferred membership in both ASEAN and the Pacific Island Forum, which is the key regional forum of Pacific Island states, but exclusionary rules restricted against double membership. So it was effectively forced to choose. And Timor-Leste's uh, Timor leaders decided to pursue membership uh, in what was considered uh, ASEAN as a more influential multilateral forum. And leaders uh, have often praised the association as an, and I quote, an international success story for its role in establishing a region of peace, cooperation and development. So in 2002, Timor-Leste successfully applied for ASEAN observer status and, and in 2007 signed on to the Treaty of um, Amity and Cooperation. It was in 2011 when Timor-Leste applied for membership strategically uh, when Indonesia was uh, chair of ASEAN. Uh, Indonesia is seen as a nation that is friendly to uh, Timor-Leste's membership ambitions. 
The 2011 Strategic Development Plan, one of the sort of central documents outlining the ambitions of the Timor state, envisaged that by 2020, Timor-Leste would be a key member of ASEAN and outlined an aspiration for Timor-Leste to be recognised as experts in economic development, small nation management, good governance and aid effectiveness and delivery. As part of a charm offensive, the then Prime Minister Janana Guzmao visited each of the ASEAN countries from 2013, using public speaking opportunities to praise ASEAN's role in regional and global affairs. In 2015, Excuse me. In 2015, Timor Leste had six embassies in Southeast Asia, but in order to fulfill membership requirements of having embassies in all ASEAN states, Timor Leste established four more embassies and created a dedicated government portfolio to ASEAN membership and established an ASEAN secretariat in Dili. So I guess the question now is, why ASEAN membership? Successive Timorese governments have wanted the country to join ASEAN in order to alleviate some of the vulnerabilities that come with being a small state in an increasingly contested region. So I'd like to use the rest of my uh, talk to outline three key reasons why uh, Timor is interested in ASEAN membership. The first and most obvious is are, are around um, security and geopolitics. Um, uh, the second uh, is around economics and economic development priorities. And the third uh, relates to a sense of identity or a sense of place within international society as a, as a, a member of the, uh, of the region of Southeast Asia. So on the first uh, reason. Timor-Leste's pursuit of ASEAN membership reflects a belief that multilateralism can support security and geopolitical goals of survival, of independence, and of uh, enabling non-interference, so preventing others from interfering in the domestic politics of Timor-Leste. The primary reason relates to this perceived benefits of being uh, of belonging to a security regime, uh, and some of the research has suggested uh, that Timor Leste would be prone to external intervention the longer it remained excluded, as uh, as it constituted a weak link for ASEAN. So essentially, that idea uh, was that um, in order to prevent external intervention, it needed to be it should be incorporated with ASEAN as a, as a, a regional uh, multilateral forum. It was uh, seen to be in Timor-Leste's best interest to choose ASEAN as a more productive and influential security forum uh, than the Pacific Island Forum at the time of Timorese independence. So while Timor-Leste recognises the importance of relations with Australia and Indonesia in particular, these two countries are, have really been central to foreign policy since independence. It has pursued uh, a, relations in a number of spheres in order to hedge against its reliance on those two powerful neighbours in particular. So the perceived value of multilateral forums such as ASEAN for smaller states such as Timor-Leste lies in its capacity to ameliorate regional security risks through collective security arrangements and interest formation, through the ability uh, to try to set the uh, agenda both regionally and internationally uh, as a forum for promoting national interests within regional security discussions uh, and as a way of trying to collectively increase influence in shaping regional and global security orders. There is also a sense of coherence between those goals of Timor-Leste that they have around securing independence and sovereignty and the key norms that ASEAN promotes. So the ASEAN regional grouping comprises diverse, uh, mostly post-colonial states with the exception of Thailand, uh, and they've embedded concepts of, you know, quite, quite exclusive sovereignty, uh, norms around territorial integrity and rights to non-interference. And this, these sorts of norms, I've argued, are appealing uh, to a state that has a history of dealing with multiple colonisations, multiple examples of external interference. So norms 
are the stable, routinized patterns of thinking and behaving that are replicated in ASEAN's declarations, in sort of social rituals that guide the practice of member states. Uh, and so these are, you know, the, the, the sort of key ones, as I outlined before, sovereign rights of member states to political independence, territorial integrity and self-determination, attendant rights to non-interference in internal affairs and the non-use of force, which are outlined in, the, in, uh, in ASEAN's um, treaties and declarations. So ASEAN norms are linked to its formation as founding states were principally engaged in developmental nationalism and preoccupied with internal nation and state formation processes. Uh, and I'm sure that Lee might talk uh, more about uh, ASEAN in his presentation in particular, but the key point that I want to raise here is that these um, sort of the norms that have developed from the way that uh, ASEAN uh, was a established and, and how it has developed, uh, there is a match between what Timor-Leste's foreign and defence policies have been since independence, reflecting that history of external intervention. Yet the historical relationship between ASEAN states and the Timorese independence movement does not immediately suggest that ASEAN is necessarily a natural fit for Timor-Leste. Uh, ASEAN states uh, played an active role in supporting Indonesia's annexation of Timor-Leste, and those foundational ASEAN states in particular uh, consistently privileged good relations with Indonesia over uh, Timor-Leste's collective rights to self-determination when they were struggling for independence. Uh, but nevertheless, there is that sense of um, sharing some of those key norms uh, with, the, with ASEAN as an institution. The second key justification uh, for ASEAN membership is uh, economics. So Timor-Leste's leaders have presented ASEAN as a useful pathway for advancing its economic development plans. Uh, Timor-Leste's representative present ASEAN as a useful uh, pathway um, I just said that, sorry. ASEAN membership would mean joining uh, the newly the, the newly established uh, economic com ASEAN economic community, uh, the manifestation of ASEAN's goals of creating an integrated single market. So leaders argued that Southeast Asia is uh, a central part of the remarkable ASEAN economic transformation, and that's something that Timor-Leste uh, should be a part of. The hope is that ASEAN would allow Timor-Leste to extend regional economic links beyond Indonesia and establish commercial relationships with stronger economies. But there are also critiques of that view as well. Some critics argued that Timor-Leste's economy would be better served by abandoning or delaying ASEAN as, um, membership plans, arguing that as a country heavily dependent on imports, it would risk being flooded with goods from ASEAN countries, uh, stifling development of Timorese industries. There were also questions asked about whether ASEAN membership is the best use of Timor-Leste's limited diplomatic capacities, given the, uh, the, the requirements for entry, uh, which, which Lee also might uh, go into in his presentation. The third uh, key uh, justification uh, is Timor-Leste's pursuit of ASEAN membership reflects a desired position in international relations. So in terms of regional identity, Timor-Leste, as I said before, has long been described as being at the geographical cultural crossroads uh, between the South Pacific region to the east and Southeast Asia to the west, but also having those cultural linkages uh, with, with states, well, with Portugal and other former Portuguese colonies. So in terms of regional identity, while it sits outside of ASEAN, it remains in a, 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 this liminal or transitional space. Uh, it was uh, sort of territorially a part of ASEAN when it was incorporated into Indonesia, but as a sovereign state, it remains on the outer, which has had flow-on effects for its status as a Southeast Asian state. Uh, there are sort of many, many times where we read about Southeast Asia uh, in, in books or whether it's in the media, where Southeast Asia as a region is conflated with ASEAN, uh, which kind of 
excludes, has excluded Timor-Leste from having that uh, Southeast Asian identity. So just to summarise, ASEAN membership uh, links with some of the key themes of Timor-Leste's foreign policy discourses and approaches to security, that rejection of dependence, uh, the rejection of dominance by external powers. ASEAN is sort of juxtaposed against the broader international community. Uh, for example, Western-dominated organisations or donor states, uh, it is viewed by some as preserving the dignities of people in contrast to the international actors uh, that may be seen as engaging in uh, more condescending aid delivery and state building in fragile countries. Uh, so I'm going to leave it there. Happy to take uh, question and answer. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Black. Um, it was really a uh, fascinating presentation and from the timor side of foreign policies. And next speaker, uh, Professor Lee, is going to talk about uh, the ASEAN Timor Resolution from ASEAN's point of view. So uh, please uh, start your presentation, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I need to start with a caveat, which is that I'm currently seconded to the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, uh, but I am speaking here today purely in an academic capacity. So what I am having, what I have to say today, does not reflect UK government thinking or policy. So as you've just heard from. Uh, Beck in her excellent presentation, Timor-Leste has openly sought to join ASEAN since 2002, or as the 75 generation of leaders will tell you, since 1974, when uh, the independence leaders tried to reassure uh, the ASEAN states that an independent East Timor would not be a threat to them and indicated that it would want to join ASEAN. And we know how that worked out. Um, it formally applied for membership in 2011, uh, and it was only accepted in principle in November 2022, and it's still not a full member. So what I want to do in my talk is to try to explain why that is the case, why, why Timor-Leste has been kept waiting at the threshold for such a long time and is still waiting, and what might happen next. The simple answer to, the, to that question is that ASEAN operates according to consensus, and there hasn't been consensus. Indonesia has been very supportive of Timor-Leste's aspirations, but Singapore in particular has played a blocking role. Singapore's not the only one. There are others that share Singaporean concerns, but Singapore has been the one that's been willing to make that case strongly in ASEAN meetings and other states have kind of hidden behind it. Uh, the CLMV countries, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Vietnam, they also have concerns. So I'm just gonna walk through these different positions. For Indonesia, uh, there are a number of motives for wanting to bring Timor-Leste into ASEAN. I think broadly there is a sense that it would help to achieve historical closure um, after Indonesia's occupation of Timor-Leste, its brutal occupation of Timor-Leste, uh, and, and to cement really the pragmatic rapprochement that has happened at the elite level, particularly since um, the, the mid-2000s. But then there are also kind of geopolitical motivations from the um, foreign policy and defense establishment of Indonesia, which I think are quite broadly shared in the, in the wider sort of policy elite community. There is a sense that Timor-Leste lies within the Indonesian archipelago. That whatever happens there is going to be of concern to Indonesia. And there's a sense, I think, also that Timor-Leste is kind of like a soft under underbelly uh, for Indonesia. There's often a, a line among Indonesian policy elites that uh, threats come from the north. Uh, and historically that has that has been the case. And we don't want threats from the south to com complicate that. So this is their kind of basic outlook that Timor-Leste is a relatively small, weak country. It's vulnerable to external influence. Um, and as you've just heard, Timor-Leste itself, you know, thinks, thinks in this way. Um, and so from an Indonesian perspective, Timor-Leste will eventually align with someone. And really that someone should be Indonesia and not somebody else. So the big concerns are twofold. One is Australia. The, the relationship between Australia and Indonesia has often been quite difficult. Um, Australia is not a, a, a very trusted bilateral partner. Um, it's I think quite wrongly seen as the instigator of Timorese independence. In fact, Australia was 
a strong supporter of the Suharto regime's annexation of uh, Timor-Leste and I think only intervened very reluctantly in 1999. Um, but nonetheless, that's the way it's seen in, in large parts of Indonesia. There are obviously continued frictions over things like West Papua, the existence of a US base in Darwin, uh, the AUKUS agreement and so on. So Ind Indonesia does not like the fact that the Timorese state is heavily penetrated by Australian influence sees it as a way that Australia can get into Southeast Asia. The second and much more significant concern is around China. Uh, I think Indonesian elites have a highly exaggerated view of Chinese influence in Timor-Leste. Uh, they are uh, afraid that uh, China might somehow uh, exert influence there, maybe establish some kind of base. Uh, they look at what happened in the Solomons perhaps and think saying something like that could happen there. It's also what Australia tends to think. Um, and there are concerns about this mounting geopolitical contestation in the region between China on the one hand and Australia on the other as a proxy for the United States. And that, that tension is playing out right within the Indonesian archipelago. So from the Indonesian perspective, it makes a lot of sense to bring Timor-Leste into ASEAN in order to anchor it, to reinforce its neutrality and autonomy against the great powers and to ensure deference to Indonesian concerns. Now, I think it's worth pointing out that China and Australia both support Timor-Leste's accession to ASEAN. So it might suggest a certain poverty in the way of thinking about the world through purely geopolitical lenses. Maybe we could uh, discuss that in Q&A. Now, the Singaporean view is very different. Uh, it is grounded on very specific practicalities rather than geopolitics. The basic concern uh, for a very long time is that Timor-Leste could become a problem child for ASEAN rather like Myanmar has. So there are a number of different concerns here. Obviously, the fact that Timor-Leste is a new nation um, with uh, very uh, weakly developed institutions, with experience of severe political instability uh, in the 2006 crisis, when essentially the, the state sort of collapsed among uh, mutual infighting between the security uh, agencies and it precipitated the return of Australian peacekeepers in a UN mission. Uh, ongoing political infighting, infighting from a Singaporean perspective, that uh, might just mean democratic contestation from a different perspective, but that's uh, a concern that the elite don't seem to be able to be, to pull themselves together. A lack of succession planning, uh, which means the domination of the 1975 generation and a, and a lack of a sense that power is being transitioned to, to a younger generation. The lack of economic diversification, um, the continued underdevelopment of, of, of Timor and the issue of the looming fiscal cliff when the oil revenues that have sustained a rentier state in Timor-Leste will expire in 2034 and the possibility of, of, of economic uh, collapse. So this, the Singaporean concern is that if Timor is admitted to ASEAN and then collapses, ASEAN would be expected to step in and manage the situation. That would almost certainly entail significant demands on Singaporean resources. And the Singaporeans are very reluctant to become the so-called cash cow of ASEAN. Now, these concerns are not, I think, often vocally expressed because they're very political and it's not the ASEAN way to, uh, to voice these kinds of concerns openly. It's much easier for the Singaporeans to express concerns about Timor-Leste's capacity to abide by ASEAN agreements and to participate meaningfully in ASEAN activities. That is one of the four membership criteria for um, joining ASEAN. The others clearly um, Timor-Leste meets in terms of geographical location and so on. But the fourth one about that capacity to, willingness and capacity to abide by ASEAN agreements, that's open to question. Uh, for a range of reasons. The bureaucratic capacity of the Timorese state is very weak. Uh, for example, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs only has about 200 officials. Uh, other ministries are uh, you know, considerably smaller. There are major concerns about the technocratic technical abilities of Timorese um, officials. Um, many of them uh, do not necessarily speak great English, and that is obviously the language of ASEAN, uh, because English is really only the fourth language of Timor-Leste. Um, and, you know, close observers of the Timorese state would, would also um, uh, point out the degradation of the Timorese bureaucracy as a result of the political situation with extensive card placement by political parties um, after elections. There are also basic concerns about the, um, 
the state of Timorese infrastructure. Uh, the runway at Dili Airport, for example, is too small to accommodate the kinds of planes that um, uh, foreign leaders might wish to land in. If um, there's only one presidential suite in the entire country, uh, the hotel capacity, could it really accommodate an ASEAN summit? These are very, very basic capacity uh, concerns. And from a Singaporean perspective, Timor-Leste does not seem to have done very much to prepare itself since 2011 in terms of enacting the substantial reforms and capacity building steps that will be required to really prepare it for membership. The CLMV states are much quieter in internal uh, ASEAN debates, but they do, are, they do have some concerns about uh, Timor-Leste. Some people have suggested, some in the academic literature, that these concerns are political. So there are concerns about Timor-Leste's stance on things like human rights, uh, and is it willing to abide by the ASEAN way of quiet diplomacy? So, for example, various Timorese leaders like Jose Ramos Horta, for example, who's, who's back again as president, have been quite outspoken on the Myanmar issue. Um, I think there are also other concerns about the possibility of aid diversion. So these states receive direct capacity building assistance from Singapore under the Initiative for ASEAN Integration and also devoted um, assistance from ASEAN dialogue partners. So there's concern that uh, aid could be diluted or diverted if Timor-Leste was to join. And I think Vietnam is also concerned about being supplanted in this grouping. Uh, Vietnam has been under pressure for quite a while to graduate from the CLMV group um, because you know, it's been very successful in terms of its development compared to the other countries. Uh, and really shouldn't be cut the same slack that these other states are, but Vietnam obviously doesn't wish to uh, relinquish this rather privileged uh, position. So they've also kind of quietly had their, had their doubts and been willing to, to sort of hide behind Singapore when they've objected. Now, I would say that none of these positions have fundamentally changed in, in the last few years. So then we have to ask the question, of why has ASEAN appeared to change its mind? And I would say, really, it's about the pressure of events uh, and, and political factors rather than any fundamental change of perspective or rather than some you know, geopolitical event kind of trumping uh, outcomes here. Uh, for many years, the, the Timorese application was essentially dormant within ASEAN. Um, chairs would maybe convene a 30 minute meeting just to show that they, they were discussing it, but it wasn't substantive. Uh, that this changed under the Thai chairmanship in 2019. Thailand was really trying to uh, rehabilitate its international reputation after uh, you know, successive coups and the, uh, the kind of in, inward focus of, of successive governments. And they really approached the application with good faith. Uh, they really put it on the agenda to discuss it, and that created the opportunity for something that the ASEAN Secretariat had been proposing for a while, which was fact-finding missions to be dispatched through 2020 and 2021, looking at the three different ASEAN pillars, political security, economic and social cultural, and to investigate uh, Timor-Leste's readiness and its, and its capacity to, to contribute to ASEAN community building. And I think those findings created significant momentum within ASEAN, a pressure for basically a yes or no decision. Uh, and it's very awkward, I think, for ASEAN states to turn around to Timor-Leste and say, well, sorry, you're just not good enough. Also, Cambodian Prime Minister Hun Sen had made it a big priority for his chairmanship. I think he really wanted a tangible win last year. Uh, and the Timorese, uh, and here it's possible that they were kind of egged on by Indonesia here, they were also ramping up the pressure, both in public and, and in private. There's a you know, notorious speech that Ramos Horta gave in Singapore, complaining that it was uh, easier to get into heaven than it was to, to, um, to enter ASEAN. And I think that caused uh, considerable embarrassment to, in some ASEAN uh, capitals. And Indonesia, you know, in the, in the context of this quite febrile environment where, where things were really building towards the need to make a decision, Indonesia really put a great deal of pressure on Singapore to, to compromise. And I think in the, con in the context of the wider challenges that ASEAN is facing, significant disunity over Myanmar in particular, the difficulty of managing wider geopolitical um, uh, concerns. I think Singapore relented, but its position, I think, has only evolved. Um, it's only evolved. It hasn't really transformed. So Timor-Leste is now a, 
an observer in, in all ASEAN meetings, except where member states may object. And this, I think, deliberately to expose them to the, the very serious burdens of membership, you know, only over 600 meetings per year happening under ASEAN auspices. And the demands of that, the influx of all these invitations to participate is already being felt in ministries in Dili. And they're wondering about how we, how we can actually resource this participation. ASEAN is working on a roadmap, uh, which will be published in May 2023, um, setting out short, medium and long term requirements for full accession. And the, that process is, is still internally contested. You know, Singapore still wants to be reassured that good, solid progress is being made on some of the areas of concern identified in the fact finding missions before Timor Leste is, is accepted. Others are prepared to be more lenient. I think it's important to say Singapore is not trying to play a spoiling role. It's not trying to use the process to just keep Timor Leste on the threshold forever just for the sake of it, but it wants to be reassured. I think there's general consensus that Timor Leste has to own this process. It has to identify the gaps and shortcomings and it has to mobilize serious effort and resource, including drawing in external resources from dialogue partners, for example, and really show a lot more serious effort than before to ratify and implement ASEAN agreements domestically. Singapore is positioning itself as a good faith actor with its um, Singapore Timor Leste ASEAN readiness support package, the STARS package, where it will train 300 Timorese officials. Indonesia is also stepping up um, its program of internships for Timorese officials within Indonesian ministries. And ASEAN is lobbying its dialogue partners to support the process as well. So when is Timor going to be accepted fully into ASEAN. It's not clear. Um, ASEAN is refusing to identify a clear timeline. The consensus position is that it depends very much on Timor Leste's willingness or capacity to enact domestic reforms. It certainly won't be quick. Um, I think there are some in Indonesia that may, you know, like to usher uh, Timor Leste in this year under the Indonesian chairmanship. I think there are others that are much more realistic and saying, uh, if we look at the CLMV states. It took them about two and a half years as observers, and that could be a kind of guidance. So the minimum then would be, you know, 2025 or 2026. But it's worth noting that ASEAN has become much more complex and demanding since the 1990s when CLMV states joined with the ASEAN uh, Charter and the profusion of uh, hundreds and hundreds of meetings across all different uh, spheres of governmental activity. So the challenge is much more severe and the challenges on the Timorese side are also very severe. Um, it, the, 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 the challenges that I mentioned earlier on, highlighted by Singapore, are, are real ones. Uh, and it will be a real challenge for Timor to, to overcome some of these challenges. Another thing that will be in the back of everybody's minds is that if Timor Leste joins within the next five years, because the chairmanship rotates alphabetically, uh, Timor Leste would be required to join uh, will be required to chair ASEAN in 2029. And there's a question about its capacity to do that. It would have to host hundreds of meetings itself within Timor Leste. And I think there's already some Timorese officials are already thinking about, is it possible to skip our turn? Um, if ASEAN wouldn't allow it, it might make sense to join in 2029 to avoid taking its turn and have another 10 years uh, before it would need to do so. Okay, I'll stop there and, and hand over to Mika. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lee. It's very fascinating presentations on the ASEAN's point of view, including like Indonesia, Singapore, uh, to the participation of Timor Leste in ASEAN membership. Um, so our uh, next the last speaker, uh, Dr. Mika is going to speak on uh Chinese and uh, the kind of relation between China and the Timor Leste and its implication to the ASEAN uh, membership. So please uh, make a step for yours. Well, once again, thank you very much, Taka, for organizing uh, this uh, session. And it's really an honor for me to be part of uh, this session, along with uh, two senior scholars that experts on uh, these specific issues. Um, here, uh, you know, being a last speaker, sometimes uh, the best, uh, the, the worst part is like some people already mentioned what you are going to present, but uh, I hope that. Uh, what I will present here, some of them are uh, the repetition of what uh, Beck and Lee has explained uh, from, from the other part. But here, um, what I will share with uh, you here 
will emphasize on the China Timor Leste relations in the past uh, 20 years, but also give a room for uh, Timor Leste as an agency to uh, assert its, its uh, identity as an independent state. Um, yeah. uh, I have I'll go with the old fashions with the PowerPoint presentations. Yeah, uh, my outline. Uh, here, uh, first I will talk about the China Timor Leste relation in the past 20 decades, uh, two decades, or the past two, uh, 20 years. And I will look at uh, China's bilateral, bilateral engagement and China's motivation and interest in its relationship with Timor Leste and China Timor Leste relation, whether it looks as a threat to Timor Leste security or not, and what is Timor Leste's positions and the geopolitical implications and issues and concerns. Um, the big part of my presentation today is actually part of my research, my PhD dissertation on China Timor Leste relations, where I looked at the relationship between the two countries uh, in post independence. <clears throat> so, my research uh, data uh, actually up to 2019, some of what I will present here, some I have some updates here, but uh, most of that uh, are the old data that I gathered through my uh, research. Uh, when we talk about uh, China and Timor Leste relations in the past two decades, as you know that uh, China was the first country uh, to have a contact with Timor Leste way back in, since uh, 13th century through the sporadic trading. So we talk about the presence of the outsider in Timor Leste. China was the first, but not the Europeans. And uh, in the contemporary uh, time, China was the first country to establish its uh, diplomatic relations with Timor Leste. It occurred twice. In '75, China was also the first country to establish its diplomatic relations, and also in 2002. So, in 2000, so this year it marks 21 years since um, the, the established relationship in 2002. What is the nature of China's relationship with Timor Leste? Uh, in my observation, that uh, China's relationship is on the rise through the engagement of both state and non-state actors' relationship, and the relationship largely focuses on politics, diplomatic, and economic relations. Although they also have some uh, engagement through the um, uh, military sector, but it's very very small. Uh, but mostly on the economic uh, relation. Uh, China's relationship with Timor Leste, I look at, at I look at this as that uh, reflects China's overall between ties with developing countries, particularly with uh, China's relationship with the Portuguese speaking countries, uh, where Timor Leste is also part of that, and ASEAN, as well as the small island Pacific countries. And the relationship so far, uh, we could consider that it's a cooperative and friendly, yet it's cautious. I'll explain later what, why uh, I mean by the relationship is, is cautious. So here has, I pick up some pictures from the Wikimedia Commons uh, about uh, how, uh, sorry, the pictures of uh, Timorese leaders and, and Chinese um, leaders um, engagement. So we have the first picture when uh, Wang Yi came to Timor last, last year, where he met a president or a foreign minister. And on the other side is the, the ambassador of, of China to Timor Leste. So in this case, you can see the relationship with uh, Timor Leste, it's not only with the state actors. He, uh, uh, when Wang Yi came to town, um, he also met the former president, Shana Guzman, although he's not, uh, I mean, holding any official position, but he uh, also, Wang Wangi also met uh, Shalom Guzman as one of our English leaders uh, in, in, in this case. Um, this put that how this both countries um, try to keep the relationship uh, as an important for both, both countries' interests. Um, I look at China's bilateral engagement um, in terms of uh, China's bilateral assistance here, uh, if you can see some pictures here, a uh, different engagement that China has here. The first picture, you look at the crowd of uh, when uh, when he came here, he signed the uh, different cooperation agreements and China engagements uh, during the COVID time, uh, China's uh, building of this uh, strategic infrastructure building like 
foreign ministers building, presidents, cell palace, and minister of defense, and China engagement in, in the uh, health sector, and also in, in uh, agriculture sector. So in my uh, data, uh, um, I, uh, in, uh, sorry, I identified that uh, between uh, 2002 and 2022, it estimated around one half, 150 million uh, US dollar. Uh, I could be uh, wrong. I mean, I, I, it's hard to find, uh, to, to get an exact uh, statistic on China's aid to Timor Leste. I think it's not only to Timor Leste, but also to other parts of the world, because uh, it's very difficult for China to release its uh, aid uh, breakdown country by country. Uh, but uh, what China has focused on in terms of its bilateral relations so far, uh, for Timor Leste's case, largely it's focused on the infrastructure, telecommunications, and other sectors like agriculture, and also provide a scholarship for Timorese students study in China, but also study in, in, um, in Timor Leste through the National University of Timor Leste. Some of them are the students at, at, this, at the International Relations Department of the um, So, China and Timor Leste. Uh, China in Timor Leste, as I see for the long term, that uh, China's presence is to stay uh, for, uh, for a while. Uh, it will expand its social, political, economic through various social, cultural, and economic um, actors. Uh, so, who will be the important players for China's engagement in Timor Leste in the long run? Uh, I think for the economic sector, we will be heavily. Uh, rely on the overseas Chinese uh, presence uh, in the country. And in terms of statistic at the moment, about 5,000 Chinese um, nationals um, currently staying in Timor Leste and heavily involved in economic activities from the small to the large scale uh, economic um, activity in the country. And what is China's motivations and interests? Um, I look at the strategic interest. I think uh, as Beck and, and, and Lee mentioned earlier that uh, because of Timor Leste's geographical position, because China look at this as an advantage, especially for uh, its economic activity. Um, so also look at Timor Leste's um, you know, uh, resource strategy as, as heavy uh, rely on the oil uh, part Part of that also is uh, as a wider engagement to expand China's influence in Southeast Asia and also to counter Taiwan's influence. Um, as you noted in Timor Leste before, uh, during Portuguese time, uh, it was Taiwan who have a relationship with, with uh, Timor Portuguese. And we still have uh, the Taiwan's connection here, strong, China, strong Chinese uh, Taiwan's connection here through the uh, Chinese Timorese uh, presence in the country. Uh, but also uh, other motivation that China has for Timor Leste is to expand its uh, um, BRI initiative, the, the, the Belt and Road Initiative, and also to promote its, um, I'm sorry. Hold on. Yeah, to more it's a global image as a responsible um, rising power. Uh, having said that, um, the discussion that uh, China's relationship with Timor Leste uh, as a threat, but the way I look at China's relationship with Timor Leste is not a threat to Timor Leste security. Because uh, so far there has not been any strong evidence that China's engagement to Timor Leste is a threat uh, to Timor Leste security in general, and also so far there has not been any strong evidence that China is making a competitive uh, move with with uh, other players in the country, uh, and also uh, China is not a dominant player in Timor Leste. When we talk about dominant player here, for example, in the economic sector, Indonesia are the biggest player here, but also Portugal and Australia. Uh, it's very obvious for Australia and Indonesia because of the two immediate neighbors. Um, <clears throat> and when we look at the statistic on the aid China so far, for example, compared to Australia, 
China only have 150 uh, million for the last almost 20 years, but Australia has way bigger than that. And also compared to other uh, multilateral agencies like the World Bank and, and, and UNDP as well as um, the European Union. And so when I say that uh, Timor Leste's, uh, China stimulus relationship is not a threat, um, I look also uh, why is not threat to Timor Leste. Um, the way Timor Leste position itself in looking into uh, China's its relationship with, with China is that Timor Leste is uh, very keen to exercise its uh, state agency as an independent state. It views China as more of an opportunity for Timor Leste than as a threat. So here in this case, I actually subscribe to uh, Alexander Wen's uh, view that a threat is actually what state makes of it. And uh, because I, for Timor Leste, uh, uh, look at China, it's also uh, a uh, the interest of Timor Leste to, to build a relationship with China because uh, it wants to diversify its uh, relationship with other countries as well. And why it's not as a threat? Because both countries, they share and also so far enjoy the norms of non-interference in its other countries' uh, general affairs. And Timor-Leste also embraces friendly and open foreign policy relationship um, um, because um, it's um, attempted to balance a relationship with all countries to prevent any overwhelming of other uh, uh, other um, dominant and also to maximize the strategic leverage that can be gained through the relationship. And um, Timor Leste has been pragmatic so far. It has maintained an uh, amicable relationship with other countries and also keen to avoid being caught in the Cold War um, mentality. And um, having said that, uh, of course, there are implications that I look at here. Um, I, I do not touch specifically on, on the ASEAN as a whole, but here I look at um, the geopolitical complication that China, uh, so uh, Timor Leste has when it has relationship with, with, with Australia, sorry, with China, is that um, one is that the, the, it creates a room for counterbalance of other major powers presence uh, in the country. Uh, particularly uh, it lessened its dependency on its immediate neighbors like Australia and, and Indonesia. Uh, and the relationship also prompted strategic concern from its immediate and distance neighbor here, particularly Indonesia, uh, Australia, and, and the United States, we call it as a distant neighbor. Uh, also, China's amplified presence is seen by this country as a threat to the security to be uh, to uh, the security of, of, of the different parts in, in the country or in the region. Uh, here in this case, um, I look at that the way the great powers in, in the regions uh, try to impose the, their positions uh, of relationship with, with, with China to, to Timor Leste. So it's actually their security threat, and, and they look at the way Timor Leste relationship with China as a threat. But in this case, I say no. Because for Timor Leste itself, it's considered as an opportunity for, for the countries to bottom rather than as a threat. Uh, why, um, for example, uh, we look at the Australia, the way they look at, at China Timor Leste relation, because Australia considered that Timor Leste is located within its sphere of influence. It's always seek to avoid if there is any uh, competing regional uh, power in, in its, uh, its backyard. And uh, for Indonesia, for example, um, Indonesia also fears that Timor Leste will become a battleground for uh, great powers competent interests because uh, it's like what we mentioned earlier that uh, uh, does not want to see any uh, great powers uh, in the region because well, although Timor Leste have become independent, but, for the, but, but in the eyes of many Indonesian generals and also Indonesian leaders, uh, considered Timor Leste as its former province, uh, treated as, as its uh, perhaps as a little little brother or little sister in in, in Asian, and, and also um, other implication that uh, some observers conclude that um, Indonesia's unconditional support uh, 
to uh, stimulate the joining ASEAN is to prevent China's growing influence um, in, in the region. Um, this data I, I gathered from uh, Chong Kitabon in 2011. Um, I think uh, that that's all my, um, what I would like to share here with, with all of you. I can take questions from, from anyone asking. Uh, that's all from my part. Right. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Obrigado Barak. Um, the fascinating presentation on China's influence in Timor Leste. I think this is really a fascinating topic. Um, especially here we have uh, expert on ASEAN and Timor Leste, and the China's influence is quite uh, the interest for both experts. All right. Um, thank you very much for the um, offering very fresh and insightful view uh, from all of the speakers. Uh, as a chair, I think I just, uh, I mean, make some discussion, comment, and also question to the speaker. And for the audience, you can ask questions in chat on chat, or you can also uh, raise a hand in in the Zoom, so I can just allow you to jump into the panel, so you can talk uh, to the speaker directly. Uh, but before we move to Q and A, let me just share my uh, screen. Right, I think it's uh, uh, all these those three speakers are in, um, engaged in the kind of relation between, uh, kind of like, it's really interesting like interaction between bilateralism and multilateralism, and perhaps for Indonesia, which the uh, professor Lee mentioned. Multilateralism, i.e. inviting Timor-Leste into ASEAN might be the bilateral interest for Indonesia and so in Timor-Leste because Indonesia want to still like, like keep uh, Timor-Leste as their, under their hegemony. Uh, and also interesting what I, I, I realized uh, is that um, Timor-Leste is quite complicated um, cultural language background because all the generation who studied the conflict, I mean, uh, fight against Indonesia in 1974 uh, or they are Portuguese educated generations, but now we have a new generation who grew up in Indonesia during the Indonesian occupation. They speak Indonesian, they are more like um in the culturally they are more affiliated to Indonesia. So I think that the participation of Timor Leste into ASEAN, uh, the East Timor uh, and its Southeast Asian communities might be for new generation, might be more like familiar with. Whereas for older generation, it might be more like because they have more attachment, emotional, cultural attachment to the Portuguese um, like colonial time. So that might be the domestic um, dynamics or transition, transformation from older to new generation, or might be also interesting implication to the uh, Timor Leste relations in those things. And also, I think this might be more related to Mika's presentation, but I, I think some of you might know that Timor Leste is actually used Dara. And also they have oil. And for ASEAN country and also China, this is quite because Timor Leste is the only country who uses US dollar in ASEAN. And now China is really just in this kind of money and also oil resources. Um, and also um, the last point, which uh, I think uh, this is might be slightly different from the topic which we talk, but I think um, participation of Timor Leste and ASEAN have huge implication on human mobility and immigration within ASEAN, I think. Because obviously, in Timor Leste, uh, they have quite many workers from China and Vietnamese, Vietnam. Um, but probably in the next decades, a couple of decades, once Timor Leste joined ASEAN, we have maybe to see the different kind of dynamics of human mobilization, uh, both from Timor Leste to ASEAN countries and also other ASEAN countries to Timor Leste. So I think it's have more like different kind of implication, the economic, social, uh, in both relation between uh, ASEAN and Timor Leste. Um, this is kind of my deliberation and reflection from uh, the three, uh, the, the ex uh, this extensive presentation from three speakers. And my question to the uh, speaker, I think it could be, should be briefly, but uh, I think one thing is how could China's influence on Timor Leste affect ASEAN's China relation? I think this is, uh, I think Professor Lee also can maybe, um, after we ask Mika, I can maybe answer these questions. Um, well, um, because this is something that the Singapore were really concerned about uh, China's influence in Timor Leste, because we see the Myanmar was 
military regime was supported by China. Also, so something that political instability might be uh, related to China's influence as well in ASEAN. So uh, my question is how the relations uh, between Timor-Leste and China could be affect uh, the relation between ASEAN and China. And the second question uh, is, uh, what sort of immigration things like how this economic, social background? Uh, I mean, when Timor Leste participate in ASEAN, how does affect the migration within ASEAN Timor Leste, and what is a more like geopolitical or perhaps geoeconomic uh, implication of this mobilization? So, if you can have any thought of these questions, please uh, just share the thoughts. Thank you. Who do you want to come in, Taka? Um, so when we can start, but so Professor, could you start to uh, share your thought? Okay. Yeah. So yeah. my my response to your first question is what influence? So my view is the same as Mika's basically, is that China is not very influential in Timor Leste. Mm -hmm. Um it it, it you know, Australia gives more aid in two years than China has given in the past 20 years. Um, there is a lot of exaggerated concern, particularly in Indonesia, uh, that, you know, the Chinese are in control of everything because they built some public buildings. Okay, some very prominent public buildings, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Presidential Palace, uh, the uh, the army headquarters you know this really has rattled a lot of people the idea that you know china may have bugged the walls and so on and so forth um so this was a a very long time ago uh b it's very indicative of the kind of aid that china gives which is uh, small amounts of aid uh, and then really sort of played up in public so it, it blows out of proportion the the influence and, and control that china has you know, I think Mika's analysis is correct. Uh, Australia is by far the most dominant power in, in, in Timor-Leste. It has dozens of advisors embedded across the Timorese states, literally penetrated by the Australians. Uh, the Australians played a key role in building the Timorese state through their occupation of Timor-Leste as peacekeepers and their uh, support for the United Nations um, peace building, state building missions, and through, you know, very deep uh, relationships across multiple different agencies, including the military. So China just doesn't have that at all. So there are concerns about Chinese influence, both in Australia and in ASEAN, less so in Singapore, I would say. This is about, uh, this is very much an Indonesian outlook, but it's not based on empirical reality. Uh, it's based on a uh, exaggerated understanding of a few key data points and then kind of wider concerns about geopolitics. In other words, these things arise from a particular outlook on the world rather than a close study of empirical reality. So, and, and you know, if China was, uh, you know, trying to gain influence over Timor-Leste and wield it, you know, crack it away from the rest of the region, it's not obvious why China would be sort of quietly lobbying ASEAN to admit Timor-Leste and now providing assistance for Timor's accession. So, you know, everybody's balancing against everybody else's balancing this is what i mean about the the poverty of the geopolitical thinking it doesn't necessarily make sense once you start probing it on the migration point we've got to remember that uh asean the asean economic community does not significantly liberalize labor migration it only it only allows for the temporary deployment of highly skilled uh, workers in certain sectors uh, under highly constrained circumstances. So I don't think it will lead to any, there are some kind of misguided concerns in, in Timor that it's going to lead to this massive influx of skilled workers from ASEAN, for example. I don't think that's the case. Um, I think certainly the points that Beck raised, you know, about the Timorese economy simply not, will not really benefit from opening its doors to uh, trade and investment. Um, I mean, it's already quite a liberal uh, regime in that in that respect. The problem is more to do with the domestic business environment dissuading uh, foreign investors. But you know the Timorese economy is very highly um, import dependent. 
uh, there's very little domestic production. I think we'll just continue that 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 pattern as long as you know while the oil money's there. When the oil money runs out, that that will obviously um, that will obviously change. There are already more Indonesians living and working in uh, Timor Leste than there are Chinese. The Chinese are overwhelmingly concentrated in uh, the petty retail sector, so they have a very visible role in the economy in terms of you know running small shops, for example. Uh, where they're very dominant and this is giving rise to some uh, concern some of it's uh, slightly conspiratorial um, but the indonesians are much more present in terms of for example fishing or uh, banking and uh, construction and so on and i would expect that would exacerbate uh, the migration issue for kind of emigration of timorese will not be uh, substantially changed by the asean economic community um, migration is overwhelmingly targeted at wealthier economies for um, some of uh, quite a lot of it illegal, unfortunately, um, for often low paid work in order to send remittances home. Uh, and 75% of those remittances coming currently coming from the UK uh, using the, the uh, using Portuguese citizenship and Portuguese passports granted um, after 2002. So that I, and I would expect my outward migration flows to increase as the economic difficulties in Timor uh, increase as well. But um, uh, not vastly within within ASEAN, perhaps to the wealthier economies, um, in the same way that the poorer uh, poorer ASEAN states have sort of exported people into Thailand and, and to Singapore and Malaysia. That could also happen to a certain extent, um, but it's that that will not happen because of the ASEAN economic community. It will just happen because of the normal push pull factors to do with uh, labour migration. Right. Um, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, Dr. Beck, you have some uh, thought or comment, which I think you raise the hand. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. May I uh, jump in here? Because uh, look, I, I put, I did the, the raise hand uh, on on the uh, when Lee was talking about um, you know the potential for for China to be bugging the walls in in uh, buildings in Dili, which Australia actually did do uh, when it was negotiating uh, the CMATS treaty in two thousand and four. So while it's absolutely you know uh, what what Mika and Lee have said about um, China's influence, I would agree with absolutely uh, it's overstated it's exaggerated it certainly is in Australia um, the concerns around um, you know the use of Belt and Road initiative funding uh, to potentially entrap states in debt and I know Lee you've done a lot of great work in debunking the debt trap diplomacy myth uh, I think this is an important one to, to kind of uh, to, the important anxiety that Canberra has uh, in terms of how it sees Timor Leste and how it sees other smaller states, particularly in the Pacific Island, which, uh, as uh, Mika pointed out, you know, Australia sort of sees this as its sphere of influence. Um, and so there are concerns, you know, when we talk about uh, gas in particular, you know, we're talking about uh, how uh, is Timor Leste and Australia going to come together on some sort of agreement on um, developing the Greater Sunrise gas field? That's been a significant issue. Uh, uh, in terms of the relationship between those two states. Uh, they've only just recently, you know, in 2018, uh, created a maritime boundary treaty, which has sought to, uh, to deal with some of those tensions. Uh, but the point I just wanted to make is that it's very true that Australia uh, has been prominent in aid delivery, has been prominent uh, in reacting to political instability and crises, for example, in intervening in 2006. Uh, but that hasn't always translated into uh, having strong relations between Australia and Timor-Leste. In fact, Indonesia and Timor-Leste seem to, to be getting along better in, in, in over the long term, uh, even though Indonesia was the former coloniser, because Australia has been seen as, an imp as a, as a, as a colonising state in maritime area, as, as sort of preventing Timor-Leste from accessing uh, rightful in entitlement to, to oil and gas. So when it comes to China's influence in, in Timor-Leste, there, there have been concerns uh, that 
uh, that Dili will uh, look to China in order to fund its very ambitious Tazi Mane uh, oil industrialization project on the south on the, on the southern coast uh, because it hasn't found alternative forms of funding or investment to be able to make that ambition a reality and that a long held ambition of, of Timorese leaders this idea of uh, creating this industry in Timor Leste that will enable it to flourish its, econ its ec economic development uh, to flourish so uh, one of the things that I just wanted to point out in terms of small state foreign policy is the way that these states leverage strategic competition and you know, I agree with Lee that sort of the, the deficit of geopolitical thinking is very clear but smaller states in, in using agency can try to uh, to use that competition in a way that's going to support their interests. So last year, um, uh, Jose Ramos Horta did a, a speech in uh, Sydney at the at the Lowy uh, Institute uh, and basically was saying, if, if you don't fund this project, then we're going to turn to China. And that's really playing into those anxieties that Australia has around things like debt trap diplomacy, uh, about small states being indebted to China and, and China using that for a strategic advantage. Uh, so, you know, in terms of uh, China's influence, I still think it's quite overstated, but they, you know, these smaller states are trying, I guess, to use some of these dynamics in order to advance their interests. And I think that plays in with how Timor deals with Indonesia and, and ASEAN and ASEAN membership as well. Right, thank you very much, Beck, uh, for sharing your insight. Uh, yeah, um, finally, Mika, could you jump in, then, please? Okay, uh, just to have a short comment, I think I, I will complement what uh, Lee and Beck said, but a short comment on when we say that uh, China's influence in Timor Leste, I would rather be careful to use this word of influence uh, because um, here in my observation so far, in, in what kind of, I mean, in what kind of uh, form that China has a strong influence in Timor Leste. We talk about the language, maybe one or two of like less than 10, Timorese uh, students who went to st study in China can speak Chinese, but uh, you know, not many Timorese can speak Chinese. And the Chinese Timorese here, they speak Hakka, which is different from the Mandarin from, and from Fujian. When it comes to food, yeah, there are still few restaurants here. So when we say about a strong influence in the country, I think I, as, as, as uh, Lee mentioned earlier, it's more of Indonesian and, and perhaps also some, um, you know, um, Western pop cultures like cowboy or, or you know the pop. Uh, sorry, uh, the 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 Korean pop cultures, the Indian pop cultures, and also the American pop culture. Having said that, I don't say I'm not. I don't mean that uh, China does not have an influence in this country or does not have anything that we can deceive as as uh, uh, you know can consider as an influence um but i look at what china has engaged so far in the past 20 years through the bilateral aid that china provides i call it as a soft power investment for the long run yeah at the moment when we say it about uh, china's influence uh, i still am hesitant to use this word of influence in the country but we look at what i just mentioned as one small specific case on on, on this uh, social and cultural aspect you know? Uh, um, I think as, as uh, Lee also mentioned earlier that um, China has actually a uh, very strong uh, support for Timor Leste to join ASEAN. And as, as you all know that uh, uh, when you talk about the overseas Chinese where China you know, Beijing heavily rely on how uh, the overseas Chinese can play a very uh, I mean, significant role in terms of developing China's uh, economy. Uh, so, in Southeast Asia country, uh, I think, and we talk about overseas Chinese are the most uh, populous number in terms of the statistic. I think about uh, more than uh, 35 million uh, Chinese, um, overseas Chinese in, in Southeast Asia, including in Timor Leste as well. So. Here you talk about the statistics, uh, the, the China's uh, relationship with ASEAN is it's more strong than the economic uh, sector. And 
In terms of the migration, you were talking about the statistic here. I have actually a statistic from 2018 I had in my other PowerPoint presentation here. I'll, I'll try to compare about the presence of Indonesia and, and China. Here from the data that I got in 2018, uh, it was from the Indonesian embassy that around 70, sorry, 7,000 Indonesian people registered in the US embassy. It's already said that in terms of statistic with the 5,000 Chinese nationals here, Indonesia is already overpopulated and um, around over 400 private companies and over 20 state owned companies um, engaged in, in Timor Leste's economy. Um, two months ago, I went to uh, the Timor Leste's um, business registrations um, uh, office I got the information. I think she's, uh, yeah, I think internet connection is <laughs> Well, she can come back soon. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. Mika, are you there? I'm sorry, it's because of the network. Yeah. Oh, no worries. I can hear you now. Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah. So. The, the 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 information that I got from this uh, business registration office that about eight thousand business registered in Timor Leste. Yeah, about eight thousand business registered in Timor Leste. About one hundred forty also are international companies, and these numbers are dominated by the Indonesian state and non-state companies. So here yeah, we talk about the. The migrations that right now um, more Indonesian people are in, in, in the country, but also uh, I would say China in the, the Chinese uh, nationals are the second most populated, and comes uh, Indians, Vietnamese, Malaysians, and another another uh, point of view also I would like to be clear here. We will talk about the Chinese here. I think this has been a general uh, view including my Timorese people as well. When they look at someone, I'm sorry, that um, has um, uh, eclipse eyes, they generalize that all Chinese. But in the, when you talk about the overseas Chinese, I think Beijing make it very clear they have what they call Huaren and Hua Chiao. Huaren are those Chinese who left China a long time ago and now already integrated into a country that they, 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 they stay. Like, for example, in this case, Chinese Indonesian, Chinese Malaysian, Chinese Timorese. Uh, the Hua Chao are the, 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 those Chinese nationals who uh, migrated just for temporary stay and conduct the, the economic activity. And people try to generalize that a lot of Chinese people are here, but then they, we, when we look at the numbers here, the Chinese Indonesians, we have Chinese Malaysian, we have Chinese uh, uh, Singaporeans, we have Chinese uh, uh, you know, from the Philippines, Chinese from Vietnam. Those, those, I mean, politically, these people, they don't want to consider it to be as a Chinese, but just because they look like Chinese and people tend to generalize that they are Chinese, you know? Uh, I think that that will be my, my um, short comment on, on your questions, yeah. Thank you very much for speakers. Um, yeah, I think as a being the Japanese scholar studying Southeast Asia, my view is also constructed to kind of China is a big portion for relation and Japanese diplomat, uh, people kind of in Timor Leste kind of like making the soft power of Japan against BRI initiative of China. So, I mean, that's might be quite in Asia, East Asia, maybe China influence looks very strong, but in reality, empirically speaking, it's, it's somehow, as the old speaker mentioned, exaggerated. Well, um, thank you very much for the answer to the question. So, we have a couple of questions from the, the audience. And so, first of all, uh, Mr. Ben Blunt, um, let me just check this chat again. Can you? Yes. Uh, from uh, Ben Blunt from Chatham House. Uh, do you want to join to the panel if you want? You can just raise your hand and then I can let you in, I think. No. Oh, sure. Thank you. Uh, let me talk. Yes. Please join. I think I just allow you to join. Perfect. Hi there. Thanks for the great presentations, everyone. Just a very quick, simple quiz question. Um, can you all give us your best guess for when Timor will be allowed to join ASEAN? Just a year 
here would be great. Thanks. Thank you very much for your question. So what do you think about Professor Lee, first thing from Professor Lee? 2067 to coincide with the anniversary of ASEAN's founding is my best guess. I believe Cambodia took 20 years uh, to, to sort of to start the process uh, to, to get there. So I'm going to go with uh, 2031. Mm -hmm. I don't have no comment on that. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. Because, because it's, I, I think I'll buy into what we Oh, make it sweet. Hello. Uh, hello. Oh, okay. Mika, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think it just. I, I say I, I, I have no comment on in terms of when because I look at so far, uh, what in terms of stimulus preparations, I, I subscribe to what uh, Lee has mentioned earlier that uh, I think I when when. He was in Timor. I had a short conversation with him, and then I mentioned it. I think, in my point of view, so far, um, what uh, in terms of preparation for Timor Leste is um, trying to tick the box of what the ASEAN Secretariat wants, but we actually also really don't know when uh, you know uh, ASEAN as Timor Leste will be admitted into ASEAN. So it's really uncertain. So I can't set the timeline as well. Right. Yeah. Okay, T thank you for answering the question. Thank you for uh, your question, Ben. And we have another question for Moise. I think she can come in, join in. Yep. Yep. Yeah, next question. Yes. Yeah, so just I have a quick question. For context, I'm a PhD student here with the Center for Geopolitics, and I focus on Southeast Asia as well. But yeah, my question is if we're talking about so much about East Timor, does that mean we should also? Be talking about Papua New Guinea joining ASEAN at some point. I believe they've been an observer country for quite some time. Um, I think even long before some members even joined the organization. And maybe there's a broader question of does ASEAN need to kind of reconsider what it even means to be part of Southeast Asia, right? And maybe there is some uh, useful thinking and thinking about bringing in some of these Pacific Island or more Pacific Island states. Thank you. Right. Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Please, please, please. Yeah. So I don't think that there's any prospect of PNG being ushered into ASEAN. As you say, it's been an observer since 1976, uh, and although it's quite keen to join, uh, there is. I think only Indonesia is really keen on it. Nobody else is particularly keen. Um, the situation there is kind of really it's kind of even worse than Timor Leste in terms of the kinds of concerns that Singapore would have. I think, you know, Timor Leste can claim to be part of Southeast Asia in a way that's difficult to refute, um, literally because it was previously considered part of Southeast Asia when the when Indonesia occupied it. Um, uh, PNG take it has sort of taken a much clearer decision that it's part of the Pacific. It's part of the Pacific Islands Forum. Uh, the ASEAN position is you can't be both, and it's not like they've uh, they decided okay we're going to quit. PIF and, and throw our lot in with ASEAN. They've had the opportunity to do that. They're not going to do it. They have much more serious uh, domestic issues in terms of stability, levels of violence, and so on. I, I don't see why uh, ASEAN would want to um, take on a, a member state like that. Um, of course, what Southeast Asia is is something that's constantly evolving. I mean, Beck mentioned this in her in her remarks that Southeast Asia. I mean, I'm guilty of it myself talking about Southeast Asia as having 10 states, you know, not 11, that you, you kind of put Timor Leste into the Pacific box. And that's something I think the Timorese elite don't want. They don't want to be thought of as being part of the Pacific, you know, small, weak, developing countries under, under Australia's thumb. They don't want that. They want to be associated with the more uh, successful group of more, more autonomous states uh, that have been you know, much more successful developmentally. So, um, you know, it's an open category, Southeast Asia. It's not geographically fixed, like all space it's produced politically. But I don't see any willingness to expand Southeast Asia now to, say, westwards, you know, to include states that would 
previously have maybe been considered as being part of Southeast Asia, like Sri Lanka, for example, in the early post-war period, nor to the east when it comes to Pacific. I think ASEAN feels like it's got more than enough on its plate at the moment to uh, than, than to be that ambitious. Thanks. Can I just add to that? I mean, I agree. I think that uh, Papua New Guinea is pretty firmly uh, a part of the Pacific Island Forum. I, I don't imagine that shifting. And, and also the Pacific Island states are actually making pretty great strides in their own regionalism. So they're trying to recast themselves as, uh, you know, moving away from this idea of them being small island states to being, you know, vast ocean, uh, oceanic states. Uh, and, and, you know, Papua New Guinea, Guinea is a part of that kind of regionalism. I think the the, the the one area, though, that I think might be quite interesting is the fact that West Papua is territorially a part of um, Southeast Asia because it is uh, being occupied by Indonesia. And part of the reason, I think, why Indonesia um, seeks to relate with Melanesian states like Papua New Guinea is to to maintain that um, that occupation of West Papua, so it's you know that those fuzzy boundaries, as Lee says, you know those you know there's no clear cut kind of cultural uh, boundary around Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia is very diverse. It does include uh, at the moment West Papua as a Melanesian state, but I can't imagine that that's going to mean that uh, Papua New Guinea might be entering ASEAN anytime soon. I think it's pretty committed to the Pacific. Oh, Mika, do you have any comment on that one? Oh, no. no, I don't. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, last question from, from Mr. Mabda. Yeah, yeah, okay. Could you speak here in the panel? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, am I audible enough? Yep. Okay, cool. Uh, I just have a quick question. Uh, what did the speakers think about uh, Timor Leste's Timor future membership and the ASEAN minus X formula, given that we have CLMV and I believe that the previous speakers have touched upon CMLV as well. I was just wondering how will that work for Timor Leste and uh, can we think of Timor Leste adjusting to ASEAN the way uh, we think of the adjustments that ASEAN has made for um, CLMV? Thank you. Yeah, I think that, yes, it will, uh, but not necessarily ASEAN minus X. So ASEAN minus X means that if there's not consensus to move forward with something within ASEAN, then a, group, then a subset of members could move forward with it. They don't necessarily need to wait for everybody to agree. So ASEAN minus X is a kind of exception to the consensus principle, which has not been invoked or used very, very much. I think the idea that you would sort of cut newer member states quite a lot of slack is a different principle. That's not really what ASEAN minus X means. It, that's a more kind of informal understanding under the, under the principles of the uh, narrowing the development gap and the initiative for ASEAN integration to understand that there are different developmental levels, different levels of readiness, different levels of bureaucratic capacity. And we have to you know, help and encourage the new member states to kind of come along and you basically cut them some slack in terms of non implementation, not attending ASEAN meetings and so on. And that approach will certainly be extended to Timor Leste. It's not that um, Singapore will hold, you know, Timor Leste to the standards where you've got absolutely perfect implementation. This would be, uh, this would, you know, I think very few ASEAN states would actually measure up to that kind of, uh, that kind of, uh, vigorous approach and, and Singapore's not intending to do that I think uh, the, where exactly the line will be drawn I think is ultimately going to be a political decision it's a bit like EU uh, expansion you know any objective assessment of the expansion of the EU to include the new member states like Romania for example will say they were not fully compliant with EU norms and principles it was fundamentally a political decision about when to bring them in and I think the same will be true of, of Timor Leste. Timor Leste will have to show some effort to try to, um, to enact domestic reforms to comply with ASEAN rules and regulations, but it won't be held to some ridiculous uh, or absurd level of stringency, I think. Ultimately, it'll be a political question between the, the member states. Um, anyone want to jump in the uh, answers? Becca, Mika, it's fine. 
Uh, no, I think that that answers it. But but you know maybe what ASEAN needs is um, a plus X formula where they can incorporate Timor Leste into more and more activities without actually having it join. Okay, and that that is what they have now, right? So 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 unusually as an observer, they're now in all ASEAN meetings. They are unless there are concerns expressed by ASEAN member states about the sensitivity of the topic, for example, they are routinely invited to everything. Um, so they, they're already in that space. What? Uh, yeah, please yeah. go. I think Lee, Lee is right uh, and also um, back, uh, in terms of uh, what Timor Leste, uh, I mean, what uh, Timor Leste's uh, position as observer can can you know take part in and ASEAN summits uh, according to what uh, it's been stated that uh, for the time being uh, Timor Leste is allowed to participate in all ASEAN summits. Um, yeah. But I'm not sure whether the capacity to be that one, we'll see. <laughs> That's a statement, but uh, from Timor Leste's side, uh, I am not quite sure about that yet. Right. Right. Um, thank you very much. I think it's we're almost running in time, so I need to close this session. But uh, thank you, everyone, the speaker, uh, to join this uh, panel. And also thank you for the everyone joining uh to hear the panel this is our first panel uh like a talk on timor Leste and ASEAN. so and we also have another the other panel on friday which more focus on like post-conflict society more social historical perspective uh understanding the kind of ASEAN's um timor Leste relation so if you're interested in please join that one as well and we also have a Twitter and also LinkedIn account. So please follow us. We have quite many events on Indo Pacific and other regions in Europe as well. So again, thank you uh, for joining us. Um, um, have a nice day. Um, have a nice evening. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. <laughs>